Hello, my name is Jan Kuban. I am from YouTube channel Nam Zależy from Poland, which means literally we do care. And I have pleasure and honor to host Doug Casey from the United States. Hello. It's nice to talk to you, Jan. Although right now I'm not in the US, I'm in Uruguay in South America. Yes, so uh, I personally know because we have uh, I have this pleasure to meet you a couple of years ago in Poland. I know that you lived in a multitude of countries and you lived for given period of time that you can you can um, learn about this country. So nowadays you are in Uruguay, but it was a time you lived in Argentina, for example. Well, I'm quite close to Argentina and uh... It's just across the Plate River from where I am, but I've uh, I've been to about 155 or 160 countries. I've lived. Uh, you are quite well known in Poland, but I would like that you introduce yourself because probably a lot of people who uh, the viewers of our channel may not know you. So can you briefly introduce what was your history? Uh, who are you? What your uh, what is your main activity? Okay. Well, I think I'm best known as being an author, but uh, I make my living uh, as a speculator in the markets. My first book was a book called The International Man, uh, which had a subtitle: How to Make the Most of Your Personal Freedom and Financial Opportunity Around the World, and uh, it sold quite well. And actually, it became the largest selling book in the history of Rhodesia, which is a uh, record that will never be broken. Because of course, Rhodesia doesn't exist anymore. And I spent a lot of time in Rhodesia during the war there. Uh, my second book was called Crisis Investing. And uh, it was a gigantic bestseller in the United States uh, and translated into Spanish and French, I think. And it basically talked about why we were headed for a massive depression. I call it the Greater Depression. And uh, we can talk about why I said that if you want if you want to. And since then, I've, uh, among other things, written three novels uh, out of a projected series of seven novels, which uh, trace our hero uh, through seven highly politically incorrect occupations. First, he's a speculator, uh, which takes place in Africa uh, in the midst of a bush war with boy soldiers and this type of thing. Uh, then he becomes a drug lord. Uh, I show a speculator can be a good thing. A dr he, drug lord is the second book. I show a drug lord can be a good guy. Third is assassin where he gets very pissed off at the uh, at the state and becomes an assassin. And I show that being an assassin is uh, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the next book is Terrorist, uh, where our hero becomes a terrorist. But uh, are all terrorists bad? Well, we'll discuss that. And the book after that, uh, he goes back to Africa where he becomes a warlord, where he uh, shows that a warlord can be a good guy. And uh, the last two books are uh, much more radical than that. So, uh, yeah, that's what I do for uh, amusement. Is, oh, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, your books are uh, translated. Some of your books are already translated into Polish. And I think that it, uh, they were published by uh, Freedom Publishing. Yes, Mr. Zuber. Yeah. Yeah. So if if our viewers want to to buy your books, they, they can address uh, to the uh, Freedom Publishing and uh, you can find a variety of Doug Casey books. Now, the, before I will ask you about Argentina, I would like uh, to ask you what is speculation? Is speculating helping you to predict the future? Uh, especially, you know, political events. How do you uh, how do you perceive this speculation in the relation to the uh, development of the events in the world? 
Well, first of all, let me explain the difference between investing and speculation. <clears throat> investing is putting money someplace to make real wealth grow. Uh, investing is planting a seed in order to get thousands of seeds back. Uh, unfortunately, in today's world, investing is becoming harder and harder uh, because the state government uh, makes this harder and harder. So that's why I suggest that people learn about speculation. Uh, and speculation is the process of capitalizing on distortions that the government makes in society, in the markets. Uh, perfect example of that would have been years ago when George Soros, an awful person, but a very good speculator, uh, short of the British pound because it was inevitable that it was going to collapse because of British government policies at the time. Uh, and of course, a lot of people confuse speculation with gambling. Gambling is a very different thing. It's a zero-sum game uh, based on chance, and that's not what speculation is about. Anyway, uh, I came to Argentina. Well, I first came to Argentina to play polo because I played polo for years, many years. But um, about 20 years ago, uh, I and some friends invested a lot of money in Argentina, speculated a lot of money in Argentina. We bought, oh goodness, we bought uh, 100,000 hectares of land and buildings. We bought a bunch of things. And I'm afraid we were too early because Argentina had not hit bottom yet. but. I still think we're going to break even on that. Not all speculations work out because we don't have a perfect view of the future. But uh, I think this will work out because in Argentina, uh, they finally got tired of being criminally stupid and uh, elected uh, Javier Millet uh, several months ago, who's now the president of Argentina. And it's interesting because Millet is the world's only anarcho-capitalist uh, who runs the country. And he doesn't just talk the talk, he's walking the walk. Uh, Millet does not believe uh, philosophically that government has a right to exist. He wants to destroy the state, and that's what he's doing. He's uh, firing government employees, he's abolishing government agencies, his next step will be radically reduce taxes, radically reduce regulations, radically reduce import duties. Uh, and if he succeeds, and he will succeed unless the bad guys kill him, uh, Argentina will go from, well, Argentina will become one of the most, or perhaps the most prosperous country in the world. So, uh, I stay close to Argentina because finally I'm going to be right. This is a speculation that's taken, <laughs> let's say 2007, to, it's taken uh, 17 years <laughs> to pan out. So uh, so you believe in Milei and you believe in his success? Well, he's absolutely correct from a philosophical and an economic and a political point of view. Yes, uh, ideally he wants to get rid of the Argentine government because uh, his belief, like my belief, uh, as an anarcho-capitalist, is that uh, government is a dead hand on society. It actually serves no useful purpose. Uh, everything that society needs would be provided by society itself, by entrepreneurs who do things for a profit. So, yes. So, is it a right moment to invest in Argentina? Yes, uh, it is, uh, I believe, because Argentina is very, very cheap right now. Uh, I'm in Uruguay right now, which is the most expensive country in Latin America. Uh, the price of a meal in a restaurant here in Uruguay is about what it is in New York City, pretty expensive. But if you go across the river to Argentina, everything costs 25% of what it does here a discount, a huge discount. And that's true of pro property prices. 
at everything. So that uh, if I was a European, I would want to, first of all, I'd want to get out of Europe for a number of reasons. Uh, Europe, Europe is in big trouble, and it's going to get much worse in Europe. But uh, where would I go? Uh, I would go to Argentina or Uruguay. Uh, and uh, you'd find that your standard of living would go way up. Uh, your cost of living would go way down. The amount of personal freedom you have would go way up. Uh, anything can happen in South America. It's a volatile place. But Argentina is the most westward looking, uh, the most outward looking of all the countries in, uh, in Latin America. It's the most European, uh, ethnically and uh, other ways. So that uh, it's a good choice. Now, will Malay succeed in practically abolishing the government? Yes, I think he will, unless they kill him, which is something that can happen because the Peronists in Argentina, the collectivists, the statists, uh, socialists, communists, uh, it's, there are a lot of them and uh, they hate what he's trying to do. But he was elected with almost 60% of the vote and the vote were basically young people who were sick of, having, uh, of, of being taken advantage of being taxed to death, having regulations that make it impossible for them to do anything. So, yeah, I think he'll succeed. Okay, thank you. So, if you, if you, if you advise Europeans to come to Argentina in, and invest, uh, in which sectors will you advise to invest? Well, a hundred years ago, before, before socialism captured Argentina, uh, it was the third or fourth most prosperous country in the world. And uh, today, as we look at Argentina, it's the seventh largest country in the world. So it has a huge land mass going from the glaciers in the south to the rainforest in the north, uh, mountains, plains, uh, but it only has 45 million people in the seventh largest country in the world. So there's lots of room, lots of opportunity. Uh, Argentines are well-educated. Uh, what should you invest in here? Well, we bought a lot of real estate. We bought a lot of property. Uh, you can invest in the Argentine stock market too. Uh, it will boom uh, as the reforms Malay is making catch on. Um, he, one thing he's very serious about is making sure that Argentina has a stable currency. Uh, because for since the days of Juan Perón after World War II, Argentina has had the worst monetary policies in the world. They've destroyed four, four different currencies. New currency goes to zero. New currency goes to zero. And what that means is that the average Argentine can't save money. Because if you save your national in your national currency and it goes to zero, you're wiped out every few years. So uh, eventually, Millet wants to have gold as the national currency in Argentina. Uh, okay, so every, every country, every country should use gold, or, or you can use Bitcoin for that matter. I think Bitcoin may turn into the new gold. You think you can use both at the same time? No problem. Are you a strong advocate of Bitcoin? Yes, I am. Uh, at first, look, there are five characteristics of a sound currency. <clears throat> and this is something that Aristotle defined in the fourth century BC. So this is not <clears throat> a new breakthrough. Uh, a currency has to be durable. That's why you can't use wheat as a currency. It has to be divisible. That's why you can't use artwork as a currency. You can't make change for the Mona Lisa. It has to be convenient. That's why you don't use lead for a currency. It takes too much. Uh, it has to be consistent. That's why you don't use diamonds for a currency. And the fifth reason is it has to have use value. And 
I was a late adopter to Bitcoin. I only got into it in 2017, and it was created in 2012. So I was late getting into it, but not too late, uh, because what is the use value of Bitcoin? It's that uh, it's a perfect transfer device. It allows you to move wealth across borders privately, cheaply, uh, and that's one of the disadvantages with gold. Uh, it, you can't move it across borders easily, but Bitcoin, it can be. Also, the supply of Bitcoin is strictly limited to 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, it's a mathematical thing. And um, this is very important. It means that as more people understand the value of Bitcoin, uh, there won't be more of it. But there will be more adopters. So, yes, I think Bitcoin can go much higher in price. It's, what is it, 60000 now, let's say, uh, easily. It can go to 100000 200000 300000 in the n relatively near future. And gold is going up, too. <clears throat> gold is now about 2000 And I'm afraid it's going higher also. Because all of these governments everywhere are destroying their currencies. Uh, but do you think that uh, gold is a good um, good resource to invest? You can't invest in gold because because and remember, investing is something where you put capital to create more capital, and gold doesn't do that. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry for this mistake. Now, gold is just money, and you ought to own it because. Gold, along with Bitcoin, is the only financial asset that is not simultaneously somebody else's liability. So the nice thing about gold is you don't have to trust anybody when you own it. There's no counterparty risk. And I'm afraid that for the rest of this decade, we're going to be living in a world of chaos. Uh, we're looking at uh, the Greater Depression, economic chaos. We're looking at wars, uh, political chaos. Uh, the demographics of the world are very, very seriously bad in many ways. Um, yeah, so um, the idea for the next 10 years is to just preserve the wealth you have. Real in, in gold and real estates. Yeah, and by Bitcoin too. Bitcoin too, because in Poland everyone invests in real estate, and Poles think it is the safest and the best thing to do. What do you think about? So, if you can uh, make uh, you know the hierarchy between uh, uh, first of all invest in real estates or gold or Bitcoin or 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 three of them. Well, look, real estate has been very very good to me uh, over the years, so. The problem with real estate, look, to answer that question, the big problem we have is political risk today. Financial risk, it's huge today. Economic risk, huge today. But the biggest risk is political risk. It's what will these criminals, uh, really stupid, many times evil people in government, uh, do? And the problem with real estate, is they can steal it from you very easily. It's there, it's obvious. Uh, I mean, look what happened after World War II with Poland. I mean, the government stole everybody's property. So that's the problem with real estate. Uh, I only like the idea of owning real estate in a stable country that's going to get better and more prosperous. Uh, does Poland qualify? I don't know, this war in the Ukraine, uh, I think it could get much more serious than it is. Uh, the, uh, the Americans, the American government is the biggest danger in the world today to the world. You see, I mean, it, it, it's crazy. The United States used to be a wonderful, unique place, the land of the free. It really was, it's true. But no longer is because we have these, these neocons uh, in control of the government. And um, I'm afraid they're looking for World War III with Russia. 
I really do. So that uh, that's a problem for Poland since it's right on the front line. Yeah, and uh, so maybe it's not an economical um, economical question, but what do you think about this race between Biden and uh, Donald Trump? Well, first of all, it's not a race with Biden because he's not going to run. The, they're not going to let him do it because he's 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 demented. He's feeble. He's senile. So he's gone. Now the question is who the Democrats are going to replace him with. And <clears throat> most people that follow these things believe, and it's hard to believe, but they'll run uh, Michelle Obama, who many people call Big Mike. So that'll be the Democratic candidate, probably. And of course, Trump will be the Republican candidate, assuming he's not assassinated. Now, the important thing about Trump is that uh, he's a lightning rod. He, uh, people either love him or hate him. And this is the problem in the United States. You've got people from the red states, which are the center of the country, basically, and the small towns, and the people from the blue states, which are the coasts and the big cities. And they hate each other. They really do hate each other. They can't talk to each other. And Trump represents the red people. And um, this, is, uh, this is like a civil war in the making. It's really serious. So uh, Trump will run against uh, the Democrat. And uh, who will win? Well, I think in terms of popular votes, Trump will win. But the Democrats are much better at cheating than the Republicans are. And so perhaps using electronic voting machines, using mail-in votes, using the millions and millions of migrants that have recently come to the US, they'll get them to vote, which they have no right to do. Maybe the Democrats will win. And if that happens, uh, it's going to get uh, very unpleasant in the U.S. So both options are bad, or uh, if you will vote, you will vote for Trump? Well, first of all, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I don't believe in voting. Uh, I, I don't believe in political democracy. But uh, the answer to the question is, what Trump represents is traditional values. He's a traditionalist. Uh, he'd like magic to happen and for the U.S. to go back to the way it was in the 1950s. We'll leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. And uh, He doesn't understand economics, although he's a businessman, so he doesn't like taxes or regulations, except the kind that he likes. So, uh, But the Democrats are wrong in every possible way. They want to radically change the U.S., <laughs> they, want to make, they want to make the U.S. like Argentina was before Malay was elected. That's all their policies are similar to those of the Peronists in Argentina. In fact, worse, the Democrats in the U.S. are Jacobins. They're like the people that uh, took over France after the revolution in 1789. They're very, very dangerous. They're criminal personalities, actually. So to answer the question, Yes, I, I hope Trump wins, but it's not like he's going to be magic. Okay, so let's uh, let's um, finish with the sad sad information and let's switch to maybe things which will be v more interesting and m maybe joyful. I would like to talk uh, about uh, your books, which were published in Poland. Can you say a few words about uh, your first book, Investing in Difficult Times? Uh, what is uh, this book about? Well, what I try to do is explain uh, basic economics. because and, and nobody wants to hear about economics. It's boring. It's complex. No, not really. Economics is really just understanding the way the world works and how progress is made. And so this is what I try to explain. 
It is uh, not Keynesian. Keynesianism is very destructive. It's anti-Marxist. Uh, so try to explain the way things are, the way things should be. And the problem is, is that the state government, when it's involved in the society, creates distortions, creates misallocations of capital. And these things eventually result in an economic depression, a period of time when most people's standard of living goes down. And I'm of the opinion that even though we've had tremendous technical progress in science and engineering uh, that, has in, that has been hugely helpful to raising the standard, in fact, that's the only thing that raises the standard of living. You produce more than you consume and save the difference and innovate in technology. And that's why the standard of living goes up. But uh, these distortions the governments have created are gonna result in an economic collapse uh, and the standard of living will go down. And um, it has been going down for the average American since for the last 50 years, believe it or not. It doesn't look like it because he's taken on huge amounts of debt and consumer debt is a very bad thing. It's like, if I borrow a million dollars right now, I can live very high off the hog. I can have a very high standard of living for the next year or the next 10 years with that borrowed money. But when I have to pay the money back and pay it back with interest, my standard of living will go much lower than it used to be. And that's what America has been doing for the last 50 years. And finally, the as we say, the chickens are going to come home to roost. And uh, it, it can be, I think we're going to have a serious financial collapse, uh, which is to say stocks and bond prices and so forth will go down an economic collapse, which means high unemployment and businesses fail. Um, and uh, that's what a depression is all about. So uh, hold on to your hat. Okay, so this book advice how to behave in such difficult times. That's exactly right. Exactly. It's why, why a depression happens and what you should do so that you are not hurt by it, or maybe can profit from it because most of the real wealth in the world will still be here if the economy collapses. I mean, the technologies and the factories and the farms and the mines, they'll all still be here. They'll just change ownership. So your second book uh, translated into Polish, it's a speculator. And could you uh, briefly introduce as well uh, this book to our audience and also uh, answer um, to such a question, what role in the development of society plays spec uh, play speculators? Because in the communist period of time in Poland and Soviet Union, we didn't have speculator speculators. They were condemned, you know, it was banned. And uh, in the United States, we have, uh, you know, a lot of speculators. So they, they should play rather a positive role in the, in the development of societies. Well, they should, but if we lived in a free market society, which we don't, uh, speculators would be unemployed because governments would not be there to create these distortions in the market. Uh, but uh, the more powerful governments become, the more opportunities there are for speculators. Now, my book, Speculator, is written in the form of a novel that takes our hero when he's 18 and uh, it talks about how he becomes a speculator. And in the, in the novel, you learn the theory of speculation. And in the novel, our, <clears throat> our hero uh, gets involved in uh, small mining stocks. And that's my specialty. Mining incidentally is about the most stupid thing in the world to try to invest in for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but as a speculation, it can be very good because the mining stocks are very volatile. So in Speculator, our hero, Charles Knight, 
gets lucky on a Canadian mining stock with a property in Africa, and he decides, I think I'm going to go to Africa and take a look at this mine and the company. He finds out it's a fraud. Uh, there's always been a lot of fraud in mining. And, uh, you know, he gets involved in a bush war. And anyway, one way or another, he starts out with $10,000 and turns it into $100 million, uh, in Africa. And then uh, the U.S. government takes it all away from him. For That's what the novel is about. So anyway, it's a very good read. Uh, I recommend it. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. But because I committed an error, probably I didn't pick up your message. So I would like you ask you. Uh, I would like to ask you to repeat once again the difference between speculator, investor, and gambler. Okay, an investor is somebody who allocates capital to make more capital. It's like planting a seed so that you get a, a garden from it. Uh, it's very hard, unfortunately, today to be an investor because the government is always there, cutting down the garden, putting Agent or Orange on the garden, uh, when your garden grows up, stealing the fruits. So <clears throat> in today's world, it's very good to be a, it's good to be an investor, but very hard in today's world to be an investor. So what you should look to do is be a speculator. Now, a speculator doesn't try to grow new wealth. He tries to take advantage of distortions that the government creates in the market to buy low and sell high. Um, the third, but people often confuse a speculator with a gambler. And a gambler, it's a, a gambler is a zero sum game. Uh, you're not, we, we're counting on chance, on accident to win. And since most people confuse speculation with gambling, they lose when they speculate. The average guy should not speculate unless he's got a very good grip on. Uh, technology and psychology and politics and many things. Um, a gambler doesn't need any of that. Uh, and uh, so those are the three things. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, you are a very good professor. And I would like that you repeat because I would like that this message will be uh, will be left in our uh, viewers brains. Uh, so the uh, really last question, you already said that it's uh, you advise to come to Argentina or Uruguay, but do you have another countries which are worth to to invest or, or live in? Well, I'll say it again, that Europe is a bad place to be for the next decade. Uh, all these governments in Europe are very powerful and socialist oriented. And uh, and I'm afraid that once again I'll say this: that what's going on between uh, with the Ukraine and Russia, I, I think it might get out of control. So that's one thing. The other thing is is that throughout mostly Western Europe, uh, there are a huge number of migrants coming into uh, the continent, and they don't share European values or religion or languages or anything. Uh, and it's going to be a big problem because these stupid governments are putting them all on welfare and encouraging more of them to come. So that's going to wind up with a, uh, uh, a sociological and a demographic time bomb. So uh, that's why I suggest Argentina and Uruguay, and for that matter, Brazil, uh, as places that that and maybe again Chile, uh, where where uh, I think if you're a European, you should look at uh, coming there. Uh, I lived in New Zealand for years, and I really like New Zealand. It's a beautiful country. It only has four million people, um, and um, 
you know, the, it's it, it has it's worth looking at. It's got problems. We can talk about New Zealand at length. We can talk about Australia, another possibility at length. It's got problems, but it's a possibility. Um, Africa uh, is great if you're young and um, and entrepreneurial. Uh, I think you can make a fortune in Africa. Africa is a great place for a speculator uh, because as a European, when you go to Africa, you're unusual. You're going to have much different experiences, much more knowledge, more capital. So I don't like to be on a level playing field. I like to be on an unlevel playing field where and when you go to Africa, you can bring something to the party and the Africans will want to meet you. So it's got problems, huge problems. But if you're a young guy, Africa's the place. Uh, as a place to live and just retire and enjoy yourself, my favorite country in the world is Thailand. I'm a big fan of Thailand. I also like Japan. Uh, incidentally, those are the only two countries in Asia that were not colonized by Europeans. Strange. But uh, yeah, think of those things. Okay, Doug, thank you so much for uh, for this very interesting talk and that you find the time and devoted it to our channel. I wish you good luck and uh, maybe next talks with us. Thank you very much. Look forward to it, Jan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.